Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. Good afternoon. I am so happy to be here to discuss such an important topic that is touching so many of us on this webinar. So this session is really designed to give you a renewed perspective on why people are leaving their jobs and what you can do to really help stop the bleeding. And so I just wanna caveat by saying, while I can't single-handedly uh, solve the great resignation or the newest craze, that whole quitting quietly uh, situation, trust me, I wish that I could, you will leave here today with some actionable steps that will make a big difference that will help people stay in organizations, that you'll be the organization that great people won't leave. So I'll begin with a short introduction about the current state of the great resignation and how being a boss versus a leader makes a big difference. And then I'll move to three key areas that directly influence how to keep great people. So throughout this session, we're going to engage in some personal reflection exercises. There'll be some stopping points. And so it would be great if you had a piece of paper next to you or word open while this presentation was going, just to jot down some notes and some thoughts. And I also love reading your tweets and I love your feedback. So my Twitter handle is on this slide. Please connect with me during this presentation and afterwards. So first and foremost, who am I and why am I qualified to talk to you today? Brittany did an amazing job with my introduction. So here are just a couple of other things you might want to know about me, about my qualifications. So I've been in higher ed for 12 years, but I've been in corporate for 15, 16. And so I've been around the block with both hats for quite a while. I have a doctorate in leadership and learning in organizations. And what that means is that I focus on how organizations can run better. My concentration is on systemic improvement and root cause analysis. You can see some of my articles to the side here. You can also Google me. Um, I write a lot about unconventional leadership practices and controversial leadership issues. I like to say that I cause good trouble. That's how I would like to describe it at least. And my leadership style, which I think is transparent and uh, probably positive for something like this, a session like this, is emotional, authentic, direct, and accountable. So let's kick off by looking at some hard facts around why people are leaving their jobs. So in 2021, 47 million Americans voluntarily quit their jobs. And the number one reason for resigning was sought as a toxic company culture with poor management, low salary, and a lack of healthy work-life balance followed closely behind. 67% left because of toxicity and 54% quit because of their bosses. And 36% decided to quit without another job lined up. That last one really gets me. Um, that one is really showing that there's, uh, there's a problem. And according to the latest research, some of these people were reactionary and especially the Gen Z culture that did regret some of their decisions after the fact. But that aside, people are leaving fast without a safety net because they just don't think that they need to settle anymore in a job that they're not happy in. And it's important to note that while these numbers might be staggering, the pandemic only accelerated a pre-pandemic trend. And so pre-2020, employees were getting restless with the current corporate culture anyway, as well as work environments really not meeting the needs of employees for a more satisfactory work-life balance. And this is in addition to non-monetary compensation for hard work through flexible work hours and choosing different modalities like working from home and not having to go into the office every day. And today, and I, I hesitate to say post pandemic because to me, I feel like we're still very much in the pandemic. This, uh, these needs are increasing are at a very high rate and workers are further reconsidering the work of the role of work in their lives, including retirement and burnout and relocation and really wanting to spend more time with loved ones. And so there's a common thread here within all of these, and it's the boss. The boss is part of all of the statistics that were on the previous slide, because the boss is who's responsible for their team's experience, whether it be positive or negative within an organizational culture. And as the slide details, people don't really leave jobs. In fact, most people don't leave jobs because they hate their job they leave because of their boss and the culture cultivated through their day to day. And I wanna be very clear about bad bosses too. Those, they aren't the ones that you always see in the movies, like the Jennifer Aniston flick from the early 2000s, I think it was. 
a bad boss doesn't always mean a person who is overtly cruel or discriminatory or unfair or anything that you can think of that's overly terrible. It's really the little things, and we'll talk about some of them, that make a profound difference to people staying within their organizations. And I'm using the word boss here very specifically, at least right now, versus leader, because I feel like there is a profound difference. In fact, I would argue that most bosses criticize true leaders because they view themselves as too hands-on or too soft and sensitive. Others, or they believe that leaders spend too much time on their people and not enough on their own lists of responsibilities. And some bosses are reluctant to support their people too much too, as it might get them in trouble or uncomfortable to advocate too hard for some of the things that we're gonna to discuss today. So personally, I believe that there is a difference between a leader and a boss. I feel that leaders motivate and inspire their teams to perform at their best and are part of the team themselves, really meaning that they could jump in at any time and do the work of any of their employees because they're intimately familiar with everybody's day-to-day -day responsibilities and roles. And additionally, leaders really spend time listening and learning so they can help solve problems that may prevent growth and development with people on their team. Bosses, on the other hand, are more transactional, usually more focused on themselves and their people. And these are the bosses that are often too busy to listen or learn, are really out of touch with what their employees need and want, or are not familiar with their employees' day-to-day -day activities or responsibilities, and are really the first people to place blame more than take ownership if something goes wrong. And bosses tend to be very focused on task-oriented activities too, versus really the holistic experience of leading people and putting people first. They really just wanna get stuff done. So if you take away anything all, from all of that, really great leaders keep great people, but bosses, especially the bad ones, perpetuate mass exodus and usually a lot of resentment too. So as previously mentioned, a bad boss is really the head of a toxic culture, whether perceived or the reality. And there are many definitions of a toxic culture, too. You can just Google a million on the Internet. But this one, to me, is the most holistic, an environment in which employees find it difficult to work or progress in their careers because of the negative atmosphere created by coworkers, supervisors, or the company culture itself. And I don't know about you. But that definition really speaks to me. It really hits on a lot of areas that people would consider toxic and may want to leave their job because of. So let's break that definition down a little bit, because the research is telling us that a toxic culture is why employees are leaving and that they're citing their boss as responsible for that culture. So let's explore what a toxic culture is. No clear mission or long-term goals. Really, there's no perceived direction for the organization or long-term strategies aren't being communicated down to the people who are doing the work. And employees don't see themselves as part of a bigger picture. They kind of just see themselves as cogs in a wheel. No future planning for high, for high performing employees, employees who are doing the most. And I don't mean the most work, mind you, by volume, I mean the colloquial doing the most, like the kids say, giving so much effort and time to their jobs and doing it well, but they have no idea what their next steps are within the organization and don't see any clear growth opportunities. And their bosses aren't really helping with this or talking to them about future growth opportunities. And the questions these employees are asking themselves is really, why bother? Low pay and a lack of fair compensation. Your employees know if they are paid less than the industry average. And they also know if they are paid less than their counterparts doing the same work. And it's not only a bad look, but bad for morale as well. A perception of dishonesty or a lack of transparency. If your employees feel like they can't trust you, they will not do good work for you, period. Not listening to those who do the work. Many bosses find themselves too busy to truly understand what their employees' day-to-day -day looks like. So when employees mention an issue or bring something up, the boss doesn't understand or doesn't understand how it could be a problem, which is even more problematic. This is toxic. And leaders, on the other hand, really take the time to intimately understand what keeps their employees up at night and really work towards solving problems that hinder productivity. Gaslighting, this is a fan favorite, immediately blaming the person instead of probably the broken system or the boss not taking responsibility for their part in the broken system. And this severely impacts the employee. 
feeling overworked and underappreciated. Burnout is real, especially now when people are expected to do more for the same amount of money. And the quiet quitting or the quitting quietly topic that's trending is really all about this. People working less or less hard overall because they are burned out and feel underappreciated. It's a really dangerous combination. And finally, neglected monologues. If an employee is mentioning something that's bothering them, that means it's important. Thus, it really shouldn't be ignored or dismissed, no matter how unimportant or trivial the boss believes it to be. There's really nothing more toxic than an employee brave enough to bring something up only for a boss not to have the time or energy to listen or consider it. So this is, this is all so depressing to start off a presentation with, right? I know, I know, but I'm here to make you feel a little bit better. The overwhelming majority of bosses, especially bad ones, are part of a broken system and really haven't had the training to become great leaders or evolve really into great leaders. And I'll even go so far to say that most leaders today, whether you've had a, le a year of leadership experience or maybe 25, are really set up to fail based on extenuating circumstances. And I think that this is because most organizations have deprioritized what it takes to be the great leader of a team that you need to be these days in exchange for the completion of daily activities and meetings and meeting revenue goals and pressing higher ups and even enforcing power dynamics. And the humanity of leadership is really being put on the back burner and being too busy to learn how to be a great leader or being told that other priorities are more important is really being perpetuated, in my opinion. And at the end of the day, I think people who lead instead of being a boss are responsible for the well-being of those who do the work. And that means not only worrying about if they can do their jobs well, but that these employees are feeling their best to do the job well. And if we don't drastically shift this culture, we're gonna continue losing great people to organizations that are figuring this out, or at least trying to figure it out. And obviously let it known that they're trying to be figuring it out. And so how do we fix this? We fix it by getting real about leadership and what it entails. Because the reality is, is that we're doing a really poor job talking about perception versus reality. And I wanna end with two points here. Bosses judge themselves by their intention while others judge bosses by their actions and impact. A boss's intentions don't matter because doing that, focusing on their intentions, focuses on the boss's feelings first versus those of their people. And leadership really focuses on the action and impact every day to make employees' lives better at work. Additionally, accepting responsibility is a key component of leadership. And leaders need to protect their people and have their backs, or at least put out that as something that they want and, and strive for every day. It's really about being courageous and standing up for what's right and accepting and owning up to mistakes too. So considering what we've just discussed in these first few minutes, it's time for our first reflection so we can set the tone for today. I'd like to get you to consider, depending on where you are in your career, consider one of these two questions and jot down some thoughts that may come to mind. What is the one thing you need to work on to become a better leader today? What do you wanna take away from this session? And if you aren't a leader yet, what is the one thing you wish your current leadership would do to make your experience better at work? I'll give you just a minute. All right, let's move forward. So let's move to the heart of today's session, areas of opportunity for leaders, not bosses. We're now talking leadership into the universe now to make small changes every day that make a big difference in culture, communication, and compensation. So let's start with culture. So turning a toxic culture into a positive one really starts with understanding what makes a positive culture. When growth and learning opportunities are obvious and encouraged, when employees are celebrated as workers and people, when visions are shared and co-created, when communication is clear and consistent, when people are treated fairly and are compensated fairly, 
And when an environment allows for flexibility, agility, as well as humor, oh my gosh, we all need to laugh more at work, don't we? I wish, I wish that for sure for everybody. When you list them out like this, it seems pretty simple to implement, but that couldn't be further from the truth. None of these things are easy to implement. Really much of the time, leaders are simply trying to survive in their daily role. So they don't always put themselves into the shoes of those who are doing the work and realize how they may be contributing or enabling a toxic culture. And with conflicting responsibilities, sometimes leaders don't prioritize these things. And if they aren't doing either of those things, you can rest assured that employees are in some way or shape or form considering the, toxic, the, the culture toxic. And so how can leaders create a positive culture? Well, the first step, I think, is to change your seat on the train. So work with me as we play a little imagination game. So I'd like you to imagine that you're on a train somewhere. You have an assigned seat. So you're definitely on the Acela. You pay the extra money. You have an assigned seat. So what happens in that seat? You figure out maybe where the bathroom is. If you're me, you're definitely trying to figure out where the snack car is, the quiet car, simply from your vantage point, right? And you carefully observe that the people around you for their nuances and maybe it's annoyances or friendliness or a plethora of other things. But what would happen if you swapped seats with someone in front of you or in back of you or in an entirely different car? I would guarantee that you would see things very differently. And so the point is that you can be in the same workplace and on the same team, but experience things incredibly differently. And the first step in helping change a toxic culture is to reflect on the seat you're sitting in and how you see the culture versus how someone else would see that culture from their perspective. So as you reflect on this new seat, I'd like to, you to all to step into your new leadership power to change the culture from your team from positive, from toxic to possibly positive. So the first thing, our first recommendation I have is for culture workshops, setting up culture workshops. Set up a time to have an open conversation about the perception of company culture and be okay with not agreeing with most of it because the feedback will not be from your seat on the train. And I would even have a facilitator outside your department manage the conversation and have a good chunk of the session dedicated to employees providing you with solutions on how to change the culture. Encourage transparent salary and budget talks. So many organizations discourage this and it's usually because there's either something to hide or there's a fear of backlash. And leaders should really push other leaders to make salaries transparent. Not only because those doing the same work should be paid equitably, but because it helps with a growth mindset within an organization, really with flexibility, transparency, and accountability. And if your people deserve a raise because they are underpaid or simply because they do the work exceedingly well, you should be fighting alongside your employee to pay them what they're worth. Same with budgets, by the way. If you keep telling your people there's no money to support them and yet money continues to be spent in other areas, it's definitely going to create some suspicion and resentment. If you have to say no to something because of a budget constraint, provide at best and as honest of a rationale as you can. And that honesty will go a long way in building trust and transparency with employees. So the next thing on here is to hijack meetings or let your employees hijack meetings. So as a teacher, I know that the death of any, any class that I have is lecturing for a while and then asking if anyone has any questions. And it's the same in meetings. If you go through your meeting agenda entirely and then ask your team if there's anything else or if anybody has any questions, it's going to completely deflate the energy balloon because something that someone else had to say or contribute is really an afterthought at that point. And what someone else wanted to bring up, you don't know, it could have been even more important or valuable than what you had on your agenda. So a suggestion is to let one person hijack a meeting every few meetings, and you can tell them ahead of time that they'll have a certain amount of time in the middle of a meeting to talk about whatever is on their mind that affects their jobs and have them facilitate the conversation with other team members. Working in silos. There's nothing more frustrating to an employee who has expertise in something than never being consulted when a major organizational decision involves that expertise. And that is really the definition of hierarchical power, if you think about it. And if someone on your team has a degree, for example, in project management and you're the leader and don't, yet you're asked or tasked to do something with work in that area, don't let your pride get in the way of a great result. Ask for help and bring that expertise in. 
Another idea is to use ideas your team creates. There is also nothing more frustrating to a team than constantly being asked for work or ideas, yet those ideas or work are never used. If you are asking your team to generate ideas or solutions, have an action plan to use them or at least update them on a regular basis where that work is. Encourage wellness days. Stress hinders productivity. I say that in my classroom so many times a semester. And leaders should do what they can to alleviate that stress. Encouraging a few hours a day away from the computer to work out. I'm on Peloton, by the way, if anybody wants to follow me. Um, promote the importance of making annual medical checkups and keeping them, not you know, negating them for a meeting or an important work responsibility. And promoting the importance of professional development. Maybe you have a day dedicated to professional development. These moments really matter. Asking for feedback on your leadership is also really important. Providing regular opportunities to provide feedback because perception is reality, right? And so identifying areas from this feedback and engaging in professional development regularly to do and be better and sharing this progress with your team can be a great team building exercise. Maybe you can all share together of how you're improving. And finally, celebrate new employees and employees getting new jobs. Um, welcome people to the team via lunches or Zoom happy hours and emails. And please don't treat people who are leaving like they are dying or they, they've done something wrong, right? Um, this is one I see often, really celebrating their new opportunities with subject lines like congratulations and listing important contributions they've made are all great ideas. And finding better and opportunities are always cause for celebration. Like don't hide the news and fear that it will cause a max exodus either, it won't. In fact, the opposite is true. If someone finds out that somebody on their team that was integral is leaving like the day before, it just seems a little bit sketchy. So just being open and honest about it is always better. And providing ample opportunity for people to celebrate the team members' accomplishments before they go is great too. So I would be remiss in all of these ideas to ignore the importance of DEI. And research shows that after George Floyd's murder, DEI initiatives at organizations skyrocketed. And everyone who wasn't, do some, wasn't doing something was, and those who were just wanted to do more. And so some ideas are featured on this slide, which include dedicating budget to DEI initiatives, managing up with hiring practices and hiring the best people for the job, not simply to hit a quota, but instead really seeking out the best candidates for a position leading with courage to stand up for underrepresented employees that might be passed over for promotions or maybe not being paid equitably, and creating workshops and trainings, not just for the sake of a checkbox item saying done, but create long lasting and meaningful changes. And some concrete ideas for this include hosting discussions facilitated by an expert on microaggressions or stereotypes and biases or co-creating professional development opportunities with underrepresented employees and inviting continuous feedback and mentorship too. And for hiring practices, this could mean not simply just posting jobs on LinkedIn and hoping that you'll get a diverse pool. Instead, it's reaching out and sometimes even poaching incredible people who you've researched, letting them know that they are wanted and valued at your organization. So none of these ideas are all encompassing, of course. Um, we live in a frankly unfair and unequal world, but these are small steps that leadership can take to really make things better. So I wanna take another minute for a meditation as we are about halfway through our session. So I'd like you to take a moment to consider where your seat on the train is currently and who you might need to trade seats with right now to be able to see things from their perspective. How would changing seats with this person help you become a better leader? I'll give you a minute. All right, let's move to communication. So I'm gonna say something that might not be popular. I think the word empathy is both overused and misunderstood. And while leading with empathy is a relatively new concept, the term empathy is not. 
Uh, the problem though, I think is the run of the mill definition of empathy doesn't work at work and it's failing today's leaders. So here is the dictionary definition of empathy. We have the action of understanding, being aware, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, of either the past or the present without having feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. My goodness. Okay, so that's the current definition. And I'd like you to keep that definition in mind as we currently dissect it. I'm about to tear it apart. And I believe that the current definition fails us because it absolves us as leaders from responsibility to truly listen and to try to understand. Instead, we use empty words like you can see on the slide and phrases that encourage us to really disassociate from a person's experience. And we're also given permission through this definition to blame the individual for their feelings instead of helping people navigate them. We essentially just nod and say, I feel you, or I can't imagine what it's like to be in your shoes and consider that empathy. And it's really not. As leaders, I think it's imperative that we are more active in the act of empathy and recognize when someone on our team comes to us with a work concern or problem, we have an obligation to get to the root cause of that issue and pull in necessary resources to investigate and help solve. So I propose a new definition of empathy called workplace empathy, and I think it better serves today's leaders and assists in alleviating some of the gaps in the current definition. So workplace empathy is the shared understanding that employees are part of a symbiotic ecosystem in which a job cannot be done well if they feel psychologically, emotionally, resourcefully, or physically alone. This top-down knowledge results in continuous improvement of an organization's systems, resources, communication, ethics, and morale through leadership intervention and action. What does this definition do for today's leaders? Well, the first thing it does is it tosses individual blame out the window. Much of the time, the person is not the problem. It's the leader in the system. Now, sometimes it is truly the employee that's the problem, and that's a whole different presentation that I do not have today. But most of the time, the employee is truly a product of their environment. And it's imperative that we really don't jump to conclusions to blame the employee without understanding the breaks in the system that they are working within. And if the system is broken and leadership is not listening to the problems of the people, people are going to disengage. Those employees are going to disengage. And solutions are usually not created for those who do the work because those who do the work sometimes are not listened to or asked how they would solve the problem. So the next time someone comes to you with a problem as a leader, look at the outcome and the break in the system that could be causing the problem. Because if it's a problem for one, it's probably a problem for others. Additional components of this definition include allowing employees to embrace their own experiences and feelings. Everyone is entitled to their seat on the train. And as leaders, we need to work harder to ask more questions than give answers and truly cater to each employee's individual circumstances. And to this point, most leaders are sometimes quick to dismiss other people's truth, sometimes because they just don't see it, uh, that, that person's side or agree with it. And this negating of narratives, as we previously discussed, is one of the top reasons why people leave organizations. And leaders really need to take more time to see the truth in every feeling, as someone's feelings about a situation or individual and therefore are never wrong. And neither is their perception. Somebody's perception is never wrong either. And finally, this definition really puts the onus on the leader as they are forced to be reflective of their own part of conflict or feelings instead of immediately jumping to cognitive dissonance, really separating oneself from what's really going on and the truth simply because it's uncomfortable. So how do we apply workplace empathy? I am glad you asked because I have some ideas for you. Have a fresh eyes meeting. So leaders are notoriously, if I did a, a round of hands right now, are notoriously stuck in rooms with other leaders trying to solve problems that they don't work with every day, right? Instead of trying to solve the organizational's most pressing problems in a silo, it's just having fresh eyes meetings where leadership brings issues to employees to help solve and get their buy-in. Not only does this make employees feel valued, but it builds camaraderie and breaks down power dynamics. Become a lifelong learner. If a leader is expecting a team to engage in professional development and wants them to share their experiences, the leader should do the same. 
And time should be dedicated to sharing what everyone is doing to be and, and do better as employees. Add time for life updates. Meetings should not be all about work. It's so important to get to know employees as people. I know on my own team, I spend a lot of time getting to know spouses or kids' names or pets or hobbies. And I also try to make sure that I understand a somewhat of their personal lives as well. So I don't miss that they just ran a half marathon or they have a wedding coming up. And I try to mention these things on our calls too. I, I really want my team to know that I care about them as humans and they are more than just their jobs. And the same goes for happy birthdays or happy 50th or whatever wedding anniversary notes to members of my team. Remembering these milestones makes such a difference to an employee. It makes them feel human. Checking in on difficult and challenging situations. If an employee is having a tough time, they should not go through it on their own. Whether personal or professional, really checking in on employees regularly is critical. And helping them navigate coverage when they are sick is also important or, or offering to step in. Having regular progress meetings if the employee was underperforming, or maybe even check in if they're okay after a difficult conversation where they were visibly upset. The next two go hand in hand. So as a leader, you are an exemplar for trust. If your employees can't come to you freely or feel like you're trustworthy, connect with, you'll never get 100% productivity. So I suggest making an open door policy to talk about difficult topics or just to let them vent sometimes if they need it. Same with sharing stories of your own vulnerable moments, your own war stories. They aren't weaknesses, honestly. And I know vulnerability takes practice, but these moments forge connections and you're never, ever too busy to take care of your people. Another idea is to job shadow your people. Leaders do need to be intimately familiar with the challenges and joys of their employees' everyday responsibilities. And job shadowing is a great way to do this. Maybe ask uh, to join your employees meeting that they are leading as an observer, or maybe sit on, on calls with challenging departments or ask to walk through a process that's causing them angst. Maybe you'll see something that you didn't before and understand their challenge a little bit better. Share what you can as soon as you can. When change is on the horizon or if there's a major issue at your organization, leadership should be as transparent as possible with employees as promptly as possible. So many leaders believe that you shouldn't share information until you have all of it. And this is simply not true. People really appreciate being in the loop. So sharing information as it comes in builds trust and credibility. And manage everyone differently. Everyone has different personalities as well as needs for a successful workplace. So get to know everyone on your team and how they like to be managed and adapt your management style per person. Yeah, this does take extra effort, but it's absolutely worth it because everyone deserves to be seen for really exactly who they are and what they need out of a position. So before we end our section on communication and we go to our last uh, little heart for today, I wanted to just quickly discuss difficult conversations because they are just as important to keeping great people um, as all the positive stuff. So there will be undoubtedly times where you'll either need to have a difficult conversation with someone and maybe it's disciplinary or otherwise, maybe relationship wise, uh, there's a plethora of things that I could, I could showcase there. But the problem with having difficult conversations is that most leaders are ill-equipped to have them. So instead of using best practices of communication, they default to kind of management 101, what they were trained to do, which is kind of the sandwich method of compliments or maybe viewing emotion as a weakness or expecting the recipient to just take it without any sort of after effect because they're the boss and they're the employee and there's a power dynamic there. But this is unrealistic and inaccurate and poor interactions can permanently damage a relationship. So there's a lot that happens when a leader manages a conversation poorly. And one of the most detrimental is called splintering. So splintering is when you, as the leader, thought that an issue was resolved between you and an employee from only your seat on the train. And so while you leave the conversation thinking everything is fine and dandy, that employee continues to stew, never gets over it, and every issue from then on gets lumped into the old issue, causing even more resentment and toxicity. And as you can imagine, those stories get shared and then you've lost control of the narrative. 
it may even be something very small, like feedback you gave to the employee and it just wasn't received well. Um, but you just let the conversation go thinking that the employee would get over it and they don't negative emotions last and they snowball. And once they're out of control, they are so difficult to rein in. So you can avoid splintering by having difficult conversations more productively. And so I have this little cycle that I hope you'll use for many years to come because it does work. I use it myself. So let's start with say the simplest and maybe hardest recommendation here is to own your part in any situation. And as I said earlier, much of the time, a difficult situation is not brought on by the employee themselves, but because of something broken within the system. So saying you're sorry as the leader or that you were wrong or that you understand that something is not all the employee's fault is a huge step forward. The next two are asking and ensuring. So the next two things really go hand in hand, making sure that you understand the combination of factors that may affect an issue before talking about the issue with the employee and also ensuring that the other person's data is not left out of the conversation. And this means really doing your homework on all parts of the problem before addressing it with that human that you're trying to have a difficult conversation with as fact. Making and rephrasing are also two parts that kind of go hand in hand. And this means really coming to the table, ensuring that the other, point, other person's point of view is given equal weight in the discussion, which is slightly different than what I just talked about, making sure that their data is not left out. And this means pausing frequently during a difficult conversation for reactions to what you're saying instead of waiting until the end. And during these pauses, it might be imperative to understand how the feedback is being received by using phrases like, I know this may be hard for you to hear, or how is this feedback confirming or contradictory to how you perceive yourself to be? Giving a little bit of control to that person to help them understand that this is a two-way conversation, even though it might be difficult. And then the last two are closing and reflecting. And I recommend this because if you spend a lot of time telling someone how they are perceived by others or how you perceive them, they are going to, and they don't see themselves that way, of course, you're going to lose them in defensiveness right away. Allow people to respond intermittently and affirm or share how they see themselves in a different light or maybe in the same light. And in the end, come to a middle ground. Other suggestions here include respecting how everyone processes information. Again, this is something I say at work all day long. How that person processes information is their own business. Some people cry. I'm a crier. I get quiet. Um, I need space. I'm sure you can think of a million things that it, uh, maybe you are in a difficult situation that you ne might need your moment. And that's okay. It's important that we let people process information in different ways so that they feel like individually they are respected. And finally, using and statements to ensure that you are perpetuating a conversation that includes the two of you. So finally, let's turn to compensation. So before we continue, I just want to be very clear, and I've said this a couple of times during this presentation, that everyone deserves to be paid fairly in comparison to their responsibilities, as well as everyone else doing the same job by industry average and performance. I firmly believe that. And that's not happening at your organization. That really needs to be the first step. And this really yields to leading with courage that we talked about earlier. You should be pushing for equal pay for your employees and really standing up for them when they can't stand up for themselves. Or maybe there's a couple of barriers that is causing them not to stand up for themselves. And employees constantly fighting for equal pay really ensures that they always have one foot out the door. So it's really critical that leaders have honest conversations with those in power of salaries to help their employees feel monetarily valued. So that said, though, there are many employees who continue to be unhappy at work, even if they are paid fairly. So that's what I'd like to concentrate on in these last few minutes is that the, uh, there's a difference between intrinsic and extrinsic factors of compensation because a transaction, a money transaction, only gets you so far with longevity of an employee. So just like the definition of empathy, I argue that the current definition of compensation is not serving leaders. The dictionary definition right here leans very heavily on money as a primary form of compensation. And I don't think that that's true. In my opinion, compensation is holistic and it's value-based and it encompasses many different components that make the whole person feel wanted and skilled and that you don't want them to leave. 
So here's a proposed definition for leaders to look at compensation a little bit differently. I call it value-based recognition. And this is regular, ongoing, non-solicited positive reinforcement from management that employee is performing their job duties well. And this recognition takes both monetary and non-monetary forms, including but not limited to pay increases, awards, promotions, professional development opportunities, and continuous feedback. So this value-based recognition really focuses on that ongoing and consistent reinforcement of a job well done and continuously rewards excellence in output. And so it moves compensation from this singular solicited occurrence to a regular unsolicited acknowledgement. So here are some ideas to try if you want to focus in on some value-based recognition. Let people telework, or at least try it. There are so many reasons why people are more comfortable working at home. And at times they can even be more productive than they are in an office. Personally, I'm one of those people. But if they've asked and they give you a reason, give them the opportunity to try it. Annual reviews, in my opinion, should be outlawed and I am not being dramatic. <laughs> Getting detailed once a year feedback is archaic and goes against regularly consistent given feedback. And they're also super anxiety provoking and usually very unspecific because the leader sometimes doesn't really know the employee's day-to-day -day anyway. And in fact, most employees write their own annual reviews for someone in leadership to review and evaluate and then kind of parrot it back to the employee during the, uh, the annual review. And that's pretty messed up when you think about it, right? We should change that. Let people have a say in when they do the work and how they do the work. If the work is being done well, who cares if they get up really early to do something or really, really late, as long as it doesn't harm the productivity of the team or that they expect an answer during non-regular business hours. But some people are just night owls or are morning people and they like to get the work in early. Rewards for employees and not just certain employees at every level. I can't tell you how frustrating or demoralizing it is for an organization that only has awards for certain employees and others are not even eligible or considered. Does your employee deserve growth, but there isn't a position available currently? Maybe you push to create one for them. That effort really matters. And if possible, try to promote or fill internally with great people so they don't want to leave. That goes back to that growth path that I talked about earlier. So people stay in jobs when they see growth and opportunities like we previously discussed. Encourage professional development by offering stipends or awards for time and energy. And if you don't already have them at your organization, push for a small budget allotment each year for employees to grow and develop so that they work better for you and it shows that you're investing in their future. Is your employee managing or engaging in consulting work that's not a conflict of interest? Or, or maybe are they leaving one day a week to volunteer or coaching their kids' baseball team a couple of times a week. If the work is getting done, who cares? Support and encourage outside effort because varied interests deserve attention. And I think that it's really healthy if you support things outside of work. It really helps with that work-life balance. And this last one is my favorite, respond to greatness. Employees want validation from their leaders. They want to be wanted and accepted and loved. So give it to them. So when they forward you a note that showcases their greatness, respond. When you see greatness unsolicited, tell your employee they did a great job and thank them for their contribution. Tell people when they're great, when they are. It goes a long way. Don't wait for an annual review. So finally, let's discuss when it may be your time to leave. I know we've talked a lot today about little things that you can do to make a diff big difference to help people not leave, but you also need to recognize when change isn't happening and it might be time for you to seek another organization that might value you a little bit more. So here are some big signs that it may be time for you to move on. That you repeatedly tried to discuss the importance of some of today's findings with your own boss or leader and they are unsupportive. You continue getting pushback on ideas or you're considered a problem child because you continue to bring things up that are affecting your work productivity or members of the team. The culture is incongruent with your ethics and values. You no longer feel valued or appreciated. 
You feel like your efforts to make systemic change are unfruitful. You feel mentally or physically beat up on most days. You resent most parts of your job. You've developed really bad habits, like stop exercising, eating badly, drinking too much, any of those things because of work or you're attributing them to work. And you just hate working. You would rather be doing anything else than your job. All of these things are huge signs that it's time to leave. So I want to end today with a final one minute meditation before we open it up to Q&A. Now that you've completed this session, has your perception or approach to leadership and keeping great people changed? What are you considering now that you didn't before this session? Take a minute and I look forward to your question. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, I don't want to interrupt the meditation, but I would like to get some of these questions in here. Um, Kara, we have a question. Can, and can we unpack toxicity around organizations that compensate less than market, but say that the love of the work makes up for it, especially um, in the nonprofit sphere? The toxicity in that? Yeah, so yeah. I don't know yeah, unpack the toxicity around organizations that compensate less than market, but, you know, the love for that mission. So a love for a mission only goes so far. You cannot sustain on love alone, right? There's Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you need a lot of things in order to feel fulfilled. And so I think that a lot of organizations that use that as a pillar or a message to tell employees that this is, this is what you should be valuing the most is sadly mistaken um, because they're not listening to what their people need and want. I think that even nonprofit organizations have a long way to go with toxic culture. And I think could use a lot of the ideas in today's presentation to understand that it's more than just the love of work to get people to stay in an organization. And that if you cannot pay your people monetarily, there are many other ways that you can show them that they are valued that have a lot of, um, a lot of clout when it comes to title changes or things like that, that can showcase that, that growth opportunity within an organization and to show that you really want to invest in their future, not to stay in one place because you're lucky to be here and you should just love your job. That's a very naive way of looking at company culture and doesn't last very long. It's why nonprofits have so much turnover. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. Um, and then I wanted to remind everyone, we have about five more minutes. If anyone has any additional questions, um, definitely now's your time to ask. We'll give everyone a moment um, to think on that, but. Yes, please send your questions. Yeah. I think that's a really great point though, not being able to sustain on just love alone, you know, love for the job alone. You can only, I feel like that is what would lead to burnout. Um, not to open up a whole new bag of <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but. There's a question that just came in about burnout culture. Oh my goodness, I could send a follow-up. So I read a lot about this in HBR and I also have a lot of books. I do a ton of audio books. I can send recommendations. Um, that it's just really important to check in on employees that you know are feeling burnt out. You don't just let them go. You check on them more to make sure that they are feeling supported in their role and that they're seen. People who are burnt out want to be seen. That's the number one thing. They want somebody to recognize that they're doing the absolute most and they're doing the best that they can. And sometimes just those little check-ins can make such a huge difference to morale. Um, we have a question in the Q&A. Who do you see this doing it well and how is it visible? Um, I'm not, we had just, I need a little bit more context for that question um, as far as like. I can, I can answer it generally because I know yeah. we're out of 
we're running out of time, which is totally fine. So I actually don't like um, mentioning brands that are doing it well or places that are doing it well, because I feel like as soon as I mention it, they do something really terrible. <laughs> and then I'm on camera or recording saying that they're great, um, which I don't like to do. But what I will say is that any organization that I, I follow, I, I'm a big tweeter. And I am big on looking at hashtags for positive company culture and seeing what people are doing, um, even if they're individual bosses that are making a difference in people's lives by checking in or, get, or, or helping and stepping in with coverage when people are sick. That's the type of stuff that you want to look at, not really the big news stories about who's doing it well. Um, same thing with DEI efforts. You don't always get the best DEI efforts by looking at the news and big brands that say that they're doing it well, but you look at these little stories, these blog stories, these hashtags about little little things that are making a big difference in this space. And I think that those are the more, more important things than, than naming brands. Yeah. And then we have another um, question. Any tips on how to lead through the transition back to the physical office? My company is pushing for this and my team is resisting. Oh, this is such a good question. Okay. So I, I'm going to, my answer is going to be biased because I do think that there is a time and place for people to be in the office. I work from home mostly, but I still go into the office when I need to as well. I think little, like little breaks of time where they can be in the office and then also work from home at some point and not be all or nothing is the best thing that can happen or letting people do half days and work half days from home and work in the office. That is a great way to get back into the office from a transition period, encouraging lunches when they're back in the office, encouraging long breaks when they're back in the office. That's all going to help with the anxiety because people have really lost touch of what it's like to be socialized in an office. And it's very anxiety provoking, especially since COVID is still rampant. And so all of those little things can make a big difference. And if your company is forcing all or nothing, everybody back in the office, not only the breaks and telling people that they're lunches are important to get away from their desk, but also having team building exercises where some of the things that were discussed today are more on a, on a, a global scale, um, talking about talking in team meetings about what people are doing and how they're feeling and really inviting that emotion is really important. And also having mental breaks too, giving people resources to professionally develop or do um, five minute word quizzes in the morning and before they leave just to feel like they can have those, those little breaks. So I think that transition is really important. I can't give you any advice if your CEO is saying everybody must go back and your team is like, I don't wanna go. I think that there are little things that can help with that transition, but there's not much I can do or advise if, it's, if it is supposed to be one or the other. All right, thank you. Um, and then lastly, I know you had mentioned the different resources or books that, um, but we do have a question on your top recommendation um, to read. And we can, you know, if you want to share those with me, I can link the, to our playback um, if that is most efficient, or your, if you want to drop, you know, your favorite recommendation, that'd be great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have so, I have so many, um, how to have difficult conversations was a big one. Um, I just read about toxic friendships that was super helpful um, about uh, relationships in the workplace and having difficult conversations because I never considered until recently that your work relationships are sometimes very dysfunctional friendships and so that was very helpful to me um, but at, let me be more articulate in a list that I can send out post this session I can send it to Brittany and I can give you a list of my favorites and um, let me know on Twitter or uh, via LinkedIn how how you like them. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was a fantastic presentation on this topic. And I really think that those are such tangible ways and new ways that, you know, we haven't heard before um, to handle this. So thank you so much. And we will share the playback on our YouTube channel and website with all of her recommendations. Um, and that's it for me. So Thank Let me you. just quickly put my, there was a question about my Twitter handle again. Let's see. Yeah. Here I am. Yes. I hope you gave in a lot of followers. <laughs> after this. I love the conversation. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with me. I really appreciate you. All right. Thanks.